Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A lesson from Proverbs chapter 30. Who has gone up to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in the palms of his hands? Who has wrapped the water in a garment? Who has set up all the ends of the earth? What is his name and the name of his son? Tell me if you know. Every word of God has been refined. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. This is the word of God. Dear friends, how about that weather? Speaking of the weather, it's a great way to have a conversation. Start something off, talk about something non-intrusive, something we all experience, something we can look out and see. How about that weather? But you can't make a whole lot more out of that conversation than a greeting, right? Or maybe just a few things, can you? You know, one of my favorite weather jokes is actually one of my favorite jokes in all of cinema, Back to the Future Part Two, when Marty McFly Michael J. Fox's character, and Doc Brown go from 1985, 30 years into the future, 2015. Which is always great for those of us living in 2021 because then you can go back and see what they thought the future would be. And it's raining when they first arrive. Doc Brown looks at his watch and says, it's going to stop in three, two, one. And then all of a sudden, it's bright and sunny and he says that the, the joke, the throwaway joke, is I wish the post office was just as reliable as the weather service. And our weather service doesn't exist now. Here we are, six years later after that was supposed to have been. And not only can the meteorologists not control the weather, they're not even very good at predicting the weather. As we said growing up in Michigan, maybe this is a common Midwest theme, if you don't like the weather, wait 15 minutes. And that can be true in Indiana for sure. But um, it was true last week when we went out on Saturday and staged our outdoor service eight days ago. And our AV man, Bob Meister, said, well, I don't think we should set this equipment up because it's supposed to rain in a half an hour. I just looked at it before I came over here. And I said, Bob, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. It's not supposed to hit until 1 o'clock. And he's like, well, you've got to look at the radar. And I'm looking at the radar, and it's going south of us. We're fine. And from that moment on, even though the week leading up to last Sunday was at best 25% chance, all the way up to 34% chance rain, our skies were nice and clear and God gave us a beautiful sunny day for our outdoor service last week. Many of you know that. It was, it was just fantastic. In fact, he even gave us some cloud cover during the sermon and a cool, gentle breeze. See, what the meteorologists can't do, what science can't do, is cup the wind and the waves in their hands. Not like our God. We just haven't gotten that far, if we ever will. But we trust in a God to whom we pray, not based on our own efforts, but by grace alone, and who actually hears us, not for the sake of our merits, but for the sake of Jesus Christ, his one and only Son. And that is information that not even the writer of the Proverbs could explain, could lay out like you and I can. Because we have the benefit of the revelation in the New Testament, who this God is. Does he actually belong to me, a Gentile? Or Jew, for that matter, considering all the commandments and laws that they couldn't sustain, that they couldn't maintain, that they couldn't keep? Who is this God? Well, today, we can look at our gospel and see it. We can look at that second lesson, which we read first and from Acts, and see it, we can see that this is our God, and we know his name. What a blessing it is to be able to look back and say that, to look around and say that, 
to trust in the Lord and say, this is our God and we know his name. And one of the interesting things about chapter 30 in the book of Proverbs is that we get a new writer. Of course, it's still the Holy Spirit inspiring the very words and thoughts of scripture, but the writer is a person by the name of Agur. We don't really know anything about him except that he wrote Proverbs chapter 30, but it's okay because we don't really know anything about Obadiah who wrote Obadiah. We can still trust that God inspired that special word of his. And it's odd to have this kind of sermon text, I think, because really the, that fourth verse was just five questions, wasn't it? But the answer to each one of those questions is the same thing. And I bet even Agur knew that because I know that Agur understood at least some of the Psalms and some of the other verses that share the same thoughts as he does. But let me show you. God is the answer to all these questions. Who has gone up to heaven and come down? God. Who has gathered the wind in the palms of his hands? God. Who has wrapped the water in a garment? God. Who has set up or established all the ends of the earth? God. What is his name and the name of his son? God and God pretty great to be able to answer those things. There's maybe a rhetorical device involved there, but in our humanistic age, while people are super impressed with the advancements and technology of humankind, how far we have come, as it turns out, even though we read something that's nearly 3,000 years old out of scripture, like Proverbs chapter 30, it's still valuable to remember our smallness, I think our hymn just called it our feebleness, to know that we don't know it all. We certainly don't have control over all the things that happen to us, and we certainly don't have the power to change everything within our grasp, but we have one who does. Compared to God and all of his bigness and all of his power, he's omniscient, he knows everything. He's omnipotent, he can do anything. And this helps put a proper perspective on our lives. It helps us show ourselves how completely dependent we are on God. It informs our approach to his throne of grace when we present to him our pleas, our lamentations, our prayers, our asks. Because we know there's, there's nothing that God should give us. We don't deserve anything. We know that by our very sin. Now some would ask, okay, these verses, this is, this is just mythology, right? The Hebrews back in those times weren't aware that gods are just kind of an explanation for scientific realities, and those things can be explored and described now, right? I mean, um, the Hebrews didn't know that God was a substitute. Maybe this was just picture language. And here, Christian, your God is maybe just like Neptune or Poseidon or Tiamat or some other sea god of ancient times, just an imaginative description of the forces of nature at work. But one really beautiful thing about looking at the natural world and studying it scientifically is that every time you solve a question, you have an answer. All of a sudden you have 10 more questions. And as it turns out, under, under a scientific understanding, the gaps don't lessen. You don't have more answers. You end up have, having wider and wider gaps. And at the limits of each one of these gaps is a being that's greater, a being that's larger, a designer or a builder. I mean, think about it. When you look at weather, when you look at wind, it's following a current, you can describe that. But what current, and where, and, and how, and at what altitude, and do things change farther out? Or think about the waters, waves, it's just really the gravitational pull on a whole lot of liquid. But um, what about the depth? We've got more and more questions. And as it turns out, the more we explore the wonders of God's creation, 
the more we cling to God, as Christians always have, as Christians have pioneered scientific thought and have come to God seeking with faith, seeking to understand, as St. Anselm described it hundreds of years ago. Because we could rightly say that God is the man behind the curtain pulling the levers and flipping the switches unbeknownst to us. After all, if he's greater than space, time, and matter, then he would have to be able to step outside of those things and exist spiritually. As it turns out, God is spirit, as the Bible tells us. And he's more powerful than we could possibly imagine. And yet, with all of that power, he keeps it in order with something he's always kept it in order. From the very first, let there be light. From the very first groupings in six days of let there be's, God has kept it in order with his almighty word. So we read on and we, we see every word of God has been refined. Now that word for refined in some translations we've used previously um, was flawless. Because the Hebrew word tsurufa, tsurufa really just means tested, smelted down. Just like you would test or smelt down or refine some kind of precious or strong metal and see if there are any impurities. And if a metal is authentic and without flaw, it's tsurufa. It is this, this word for refined. Well, we're not talking about strong metals here. We don't care about the value of gold in this passage. What we're looking at is God's word as he's shown to us in the Bible, as he's revealed to us in scripture. As it turns out, God's word is tsurufa. It's flawless. There are no imperfections, and therefore we call it perfect or inerrant. And many people today, even in Christian churches, deny the flawless wording of the Bible. And yet the Bible asserts this truth in many places. In fact, verse 5, it seems like Agur was reading King David in Psalm 18 because he got the same exact verse. The word, every word of God has been refined in Psalm 18. You get it in 2 Samuel chapter 22. And because God's word is flawless, we can always count on it. We can always go back to it. We can always seek it in our troubles and our hardships because God's word, its promises and warnings, its commands and its assurances are flawless. It's the place to go with all of our needs and all of our wants and all of our problems. In God's word, we're told, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. Now, some people challenge that because they say, God's word doesn't get to be God's word just because it says it's God's word. And it's true, just because someone says, I came from Jesus, or I'm speaking to you God's word, doesn't mean we shouldn't test it and make sure. So I invite you to, to test it. I invite you to go into scripture and learn from it and compare it and question it and then find answers. Because actually, if the opposite were true, if God hadn't told us it's God's word, then we'd be left entirely in the dark. God decided to put his name on his paper. Scores of teachers throughout the years have torn their hair out because the paper they were correcting didn't have a name on it and they had to check the penmanship, maybe recognize it or compare it to some other papers or by process of elimination, see who in the class didn't turn in a paper except for this one without a name. But God didn't leave us in the dark. God gave us the goods when he opened up his word. He showed us that this is his work. He gave us his name and the name of his son, that is Jesus Christ. Now, how many of you have heard a parent say, whose kid is that? He kicks and screams and bites and doesn't fall into line. Whose kid is that? She's dropped off at preschool and promptly falls asleep in the teacher's lap. Whose kid is that? When he comes to church, she screams and hollers. Whose kid is that? No one here says that. No one here question. We're very happy to have scre even screaming children in church. What a, what a great blessing. But we parents have also kind of learned how to say about our own kids, kind of distance ourselves, whose kid is that? Is that your kid? It's not my kid. But God never disowns his son. The, the father doesn't 
keep the identity of his son from us, and nor does he attempt to distance himself from his son. He showed us who this son is. Because guess who said this in John 3.13? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the son of man. It was Jesus. Jesus said that, the son of man who also happens to be the son of God. You could find that in the Old Testament already if you look into the Psalms. Psalm 2, verse 7 tells us, The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Sometimes we call that the eternal generation. And of course, we have our gospel, Mark chapter 4, when Jesus' friends look around as Jesus commanded the wind and the waves and rebuked the sea and told it to be calm, be still. In bewilderment, they asked, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Sort of reflecting what Agur says in the Proverbs here. This this is the Lord that we know. We understand his name. We've heard it. We've been told it. It's a name that we won't forget. This is Jesus Christ, our Savior, and his word is flawless. And that's always great to hear when the next line is, He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. Don't you like that? Isn't it nice to be able to rely on words like that? Reminiscent of our hymn, a mighty fortress is our God. God is a refuge and a shield. It's a very basic word. The word in Hebrew is magen, and magen hadavid is actually a very famous thing. You'd recognize it if you saw it the shield of David, although usually we call it the star of David in English. It's that six-pointed star that often represents Judaism that that came a little later to put an upside-down triangle against a right-side-up triangle, and then you end up with six points as it overlaps. In Hebrew, you call it the magen hadavid, the shield of David. And shield is a very nice word. Shield is a word of God's grace because to trust in a shield that will always protect, that will defend, is a simple trust. And that's what faith consists of, a simple trust. Simple trust that God is who he said he is, that God does protect, that Jesus Christ saves, that he delivers, that he defends, that he protects. Because when the boat is rocking, God comes knocking. And that's part of a a simple faith, to know that God is still in control, He still cups the forces of nature in his mighty hands. He still causes us to flourish and to grow in patience and perseverance even when we're compressed under our troubles. In the worst troubles, you still know the name of Jesus Christ. In the darkest of times, you still know your Lord of grace. In the valley of the shadow of death, you still know your good shepherd's guiding voice. In the guilt of your sin, you know one who took those sins to the cross to take them away and distance you from them forever. In swirling clouds and storming cyclones, let the sinner react with simple trust. Let the hurting look to heaven. Let the crushed pray with confidence. Let the lonely live again in God's goodness. And let the one who's frightened by death be filled with excitement for heaven. And let him who's pressed down trust in God and all of his peace, his otherworldly peace that you can't find in this boat. You can only find it in the words of God. For the sinner who knows God by faith alone lives unafraid now and lives forever in eternity. So what happens when you combine a flawless God with flawless words? What happens when you've got a God who can go up and down into heaven at will and who's done that, humanly speaking, as a a human being, who's followed the law here under heaven and has gone back up again at his ascension? What happens when you've got a God who can cup the wind in his waves and still the storms with his word? What happens when you've got a God who can gather up the waters in his bathrobe and who has the ends of the earth memorized because 
He built them. As it turns out, you have an infinite God who's poured himself into this life as a finite human being. As it turns out, you've got a God who has loved us so much that he's clothed us with his righteousness after clothing himself with the guilt of our sin. You've got a God who's poured the waters of baptism into the hands of the church so that we can spread that message. As it turns out, this is a God that we know. The God who sent us to preach the good news to all creation is Jesus Christ. And he gathered little Noah today into the garments of righteousness when he placed his name on him, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Noah's not going to have to grow up wondering, who is this God into whose name I'm baptized? Because the power is not in that water, but in his flawless word of grace. This is God's word to all the baptized. You are mine and I am yours. I know your name and I speak grace to you flawlessly. I'm not just some God. I'm not just this great God, greater than all things. I'm your God. I'm your Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is who I am. This is our God, and we know his name, Jesus Christ. Amen.